The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Good morning, uh, one and all. Good special welcome to those who are visitors among us this morning, both here and online on YouTube. What a joy and a privilege it is to welcome you here on this particular Sunday, this Sunday that falls within the week of prayer for Christian unity. And as is our custom, we have a special guest preacher today. We have the Reverend Dr. James Luke, uh, no stranger to many of us here at Christ Church. Uh, uh, Dr. Luke has been involved in our community, and it's certainly in the South Asian community, and with International Christian Voice, and of course is very active in our local ministerial. Uh, it is a joy and a privilege to welcome him and his brother-in-law here today uh, with, with us. Uh, he will be bringing the Word of God to us today. Uh, let's begin then as we pray together the calling for purity. Let us pray. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you, and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Will the congregation please be seated, and the children, come and join me on the chancel steps. Can you tell? All right. Wow, good morning. Well, good morning. I feel like Miss Marple from Rumper Room. <laughs> That's a joke for your parents. Um, does anybody here like to go fishing? You like to go fishing, Amelia? You like to go fishing, Claire? That's really cool. So you probably, maybe you recognize what this is. What do you think that is? It's a fishing rod. And some of you people, some of you kids that don't go fishing know that this is a fishing rod. This is the kind of fishing rod that you have for casting and for the summer months. Ah, but we're Canadians, aren't we? We live in Ontario. This is the kind of fishing rod you have for ice fishing. And that's a different kind of fishing because you don't throw lines or, or cast. You usually have a nice little hut out on the ice, out on the lake, with a hole in it, and everybody sits around with one of these things, and you wait for a bite. Now, of course, this is all my son's stuff, right? Because you know, the kind of fishing I do is actually in the supermarket. <laughs> I know where to get fish, and it's next to the French fries. <laughs> but you know, to be a good fisherman or a good fisher folk person, right? To, to, to be good at fishing, you've got to know a little bit about fish, don't you? Now, some of you who go fishing know that probably the best time to fish is early in the morning, or late at night when the sun is rising or setting. Because that's when the fish like to, wow, they like to go around the shoals and around the, the shallow parts of the water and that's when they like to feed together. Now, being a fisherman, you've got to know those things about fish. You've got to know about fish, how they live and work and live together in communities and families and schools. And you've got to know where they are hungry in order for you to catch fish. Now, all this stuff with hooks and reels and all that stuff, that's sort of the way we normally fish for sport here in this part of the world. But way back in the time of Jesus, in the time of the early church, they didn't fish with all this stuff. They fished with great big nets. And not like this. They weren't on poles. They looked like, well, great big blankets. Great big blankets with, with 
with uh, all sorts of weights around the edge. Well, they weren't blankets. They had holes in them, like net. Yes, my. That's, that's for a big fish. That is a net, right? So the nets that they had in biblical time were, were huge and big. And they took a lot of this to operate, let me tell you. And you would go out at the beginning of the day or at the end of the day in your boat to where the, you knew the fish were. And you would take this great big net and you would cast it out. And then you would pull the ropes from the bottom of the net and from the top so it made a nice little, little uh, envelope, great big thing, and it would pull the fish. And you would pull the fish in to the boat, and guess what? They'd swim along nicely because they were all together. You wouldn't fight with them. There was no hook in their mouths. You brought them all in whole, a well, and alive. Imagine that. This morning in our gospel text, Jesus is walking on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, and he comes across four disciples. Simon and Andrew, and then a little later, James and John. And he says the same thing to all four of them. It's an invitation. He says, come with me, follow me, and I will make you fish. Not for these fish, but for people, fishers of men. Where you go, Michelle? I will make you fishers of men. I will make you fish for people. And you know all of the skill, all of the knowledge, and all of the background that you had about fish, you could apply some of that to fishing for people. Because I tell you what, when you were fishing for fish, you needed to be strong, you needed to be dedicated, you needed to get up early in the morning, and go to bed till late at night, because you needed to work at it. And Jesus says, come with me, and I will make you fish for people. And just like fishing for fish, when we fish for people, we've got to know about people. We've got to know about what their needs are, where they live, what they need in life, and how we can serve them. And when Jesus says to the early disciples, and he says to us, come with me and I will make you fish for people, he means that we are to gather in people from all across the city and all across the world. Regardless of what background we have, regardless of what country we were born in, regardless of what language we speak, regardless of all that, I will make you fish for people. And together, as a community, that's what we do. We fish for people. And this gets really cool because we want to pull people in that gospel net into the boat, which is the church. And the church is what? The body of Christ into the community. And so we're trying to pull people in, families, couples, groups, people from all sorts and conditions into that boat the ark, the church. Here's a little fun fact. Do you know where you're sitting today? Congregation, the children? This part of the building is called the nave. That's where we get the word navy from. And it's to remind us that we, together in the body of Christ, are in the bark, the ark, which is the church that carries us through the journey of life. And we're reminded, we're reminded that even by the building. Look up in the ceiling. That's supposed to look like the bottom of a boat. And it does, doesn't it? It reminds us that we together are fishers of people. We fish for people to bring them into the church so that they may know the good news of Jesus Christ and that they may know the salvation that he has to offer all people. So you guys are going to go to Sunday school and you're going to hear all sorts of good things about being fishers of people. And I'm just so glad that today we get to celebrate that we do that not just as a congregation, not just part as a denomination, but the whole body of Christ throughout the world. Let's pray.
Heavenly Father, we thank you that you indeed call us to be fish for people, to be to fish for people. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you would ever help us to understand people's needs, their wants, and their concerns as we seek to draw them into your ark, the church. Grant us wisdom, discernment, understanding, and the ability to follow you where you're already active. For we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Time for Sunday school with Mrs. DeRoche at the back of the church. Let us pray. Almighty God, by grace alone, you call us and accept us into your service. Strengthen us by your spirit and make us worthy of our call. This we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading is taken from the book of Jonah, chapter 3, beginning to read from the first verse. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk. And he cried out, 40 days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed the fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When God saw that they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. The word of the Lord. Our second reading is taken from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. I mean, brothers and sisters, the appointed time has grown short. From now on, let even those who have wives be as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no possessions, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it, for the present form of this world is passing away. The word of the Lord.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat, mending the nets. Immediately, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed Jesus. The Gospel of Christ. Praise Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody left it on view. <laughs> Can you hand me now? <clears throat> That's not a very nice thing to do to a guest, is it? <laughs> Sorry. We live in a we live in a world which is which is a lot of technology. <laughs> Let us pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. As uh, Dr. Gilmore told you that I am the outreach or intercultural pastor for Lutheran Church Canada, and I've been serving for last over 10 years now. I came to Canada in 1992. And then, of course, uh, in 2005, the Lord called me uh, to this outreach mission of the Lutheran Church Canada, which its goal, uh, Pablo, people of the book, Lutheran Outreach. You know, uh, some of my friends are here too. They, they know that we belong to Pakistan, which is, you know, living over there today is a challenge itself. And being a Christian there, it is almost becoming now impossible to live in that country. But thank God that uh, we believed in our Lord Jesus Christ and we stayed there. I was, actually, I served the Pakistan Air Force for about 27 years before I came to Canada in 92. And the reason of coming over here was basically the persecution 
which is going on in that country. So with, with that, I come to that we live in a very turbulent world where we see wars going on as we look toward Ukraine and Israel today. General elections are also coming up, both in the US and Canada. The inflation is high, and the stock market is volatile all the time. And if you are you know, dealing in crypto, then it is all the more uncertain how the world is shaping up. The Houthis' attacks on commercial ships is also affecting the world politics today. Some people are expecting World War III, actually. In our turbulent world, everyone is eager to hear good news. Well, the true good news can only come from God. In our gospel reading today, Jesus moves to Galilee, which is the northern province of Israel, to proclaim the good news about the kingdom of God. And let me announce at the outset that there cannot be a better news than what Jesus is proclaiming today. God's word is for all ages. So although Jesus proclaimed the good news in Galilee 2,000 years ago, it is even valid today. And that good news is called, in our language, it's called Injil, which is the New Testament. The New Testament itself is called Injil, and Injil means good news. Well, we know that before Christ came, John the Baptist was also professing that we should, that they should repent of their sins so that, that the kingdom of God is near. And that's what Jesus started doing that when he moved to Galilee. We know that John the Baptist was killed and we all know why he was killed. So it was very challenging for Jesus to actually preach in Judea. So he moves to Galilee and from Galilee he starts his ministry. And because of the good news, we, we named our radio. Actually, I preach on the radio every Sunday, and I preach even today. And it goes from 8 to 9 on AM 770. And I've been preaching there for the last 15, 13 years now. It's a Muslim station, but somehow they like us here. <laughs> they don't like us elsewhere, but, but they do like us here. And they say, because of you, our, our radio is blessed. And let me tell you that we, when we were, we were trying to name the station as to what we should name it, and ultimately we came to the same very words of Jesus that we had, Voice of Christ radio station. So if you go on that, you will see Voice of Christ. In our language, it is called Masiki Awas. And that's the radio station we uh, preach on. So voice of Christ is so important this morning that we should be able to understand it and we should be able to respond to that. We know that in the Old Testament also he has given a call to Jonah to go to the city of Nineveh to preach the good news. And in our gospel reading as well, he has given a call to 12 persons to follow him. In Mark, he is calling Simon, later called Andrew, and Andrew, James, and John to become his disciples. In other passages like John 1, 43 to 51, he gave a call to Philip and Nathaniel, which we must have talked about last week. So, in Matthew 10, 2 to 4, we find all his 12 disciples, namely Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, 
James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, Judas and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These disciples will leave everything and give their lives completely to Jesus Christ. Do you see what I'm alluding to? You may not know, but Jesus is giving a call this morning to all of us. He is calling you. He is calling you. So that we become his disciples. I know we are all his disciples. But we must understand what is being to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Let us dwell on some of the points which tell us how this discipleship came about. We know that Nineveh was the capital of a Syrian empire, which was part of the Neolithic age of that time, and today which is called Iraq. Nineveh is present-day Mosul, which has been in the news when the Americans were fighting ISIS in Iraq. Assyria was one of the strongest power at Jonah's time. I may also uh, call Nineveh a metropolis like Toronto today. What happens in such cities is that the sin is also rampant and people don't care about God. You can know what is happening in Toronto today, what is happening in most of the bigger cities today. Jonah was scared to go to Nineveh and ran to Tarsus in the opposite direction. Jonah boarded from port of Jaffa, present-day Tel Aviv, where I have been so many times. And we know that that port is the same one where Peter was also given a revelation. Rest we know the story of Jonah how he ended up in Nineveh and preached the gospel and people repented. In our last week gospel reading, we studied that Jesus meets with Philips and Andrew and gives him a call to follow him. There also we find the discipleship plan which goes like this. Number one point. And if we go back to John's gospel, where Jesus is giving such a call to some of his disciples in chapter 1, verses 29, it says the second day. And then in verse 35, again he says the second day. And verse 43, again we read the second day. And then in chapter 3, it says the third day. Do you know why it is so? It is going, taking us back to Genesis 1, when it was about the first day, the second day, the third day, and creation was taking place. What is happening here? A new creation is being <coughs> taking place. New people are being called to faith, and the gospel tells these people what to do. Second point is, that it is Jesus who calls us. We know that these disciples did not go to Jesus, but that Jesus came to them and called them to his discipleship. He said that come and I will make you fishes of men. I was looking at the pastor when he was actually addressing the uh, children and I'm reminded that I'm also a fisherman, by the way. So this is our third generation we are fishing. And we go all the, all the time to the, I have fished with rods. I have also fished with nets. By the way, we are not allowed to fish with nets in Canada. But in Pakistan, you can do anything, whatever you want. <laughs> That's a country where the, the, the law doesn't apply. You are free. You know, one of my friends, uh, one of my Muslim friends, he, he told me when I, when I was coming to Canada, he said, why are you going to Canada? There is no freedom there. 
I said, excuse me, there is no freedom in Canada? He says, of course. I said, how come? He said, you can do anything here and nobody is going to um, ask you what you're doing. Over there, you cannot throw a, 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 even a paper on the, on the road. I said, yes. But you, do you know what is the true freedom? That is the true freedom. When you obey the rules, not here. Over there, when the, red, when the green light is off and the red light comes up, people just drive through. And w one of the guys who told me that, you know, he, he visited Europe. And when he went back, when he was driving and some people were passing through red lights and he was stopping. And some people, you know, some of, one of them stopped and he says, stupid, why are you, aren't you going? So this is how the things are. And the, about the fishing, this is the same thing. People fish over there with nets and everything. Everything is allowed. Now Jesus is the one who calls us. And Jesus is the one who called these dis uh, disciples. We know. How do we know that? Because it's not the only one, only time when Jesus has called his disciples. We know that Jesus has called, uh, in the, even in the Old Testament, we know about Jonah. Jonah was called. Although he, he, tried, he tried to uh, disobey God's orders and he went to Tarsis, the opposite side, but we cannot run from God. Once he has called you, then you become his disciples. Then you become his disciples. We know that Abraham was called, and Abraham listened to God, and ultimately he ended up in the land of the promise. When Jesus calls, then you, when he finds you, then you find others. When we read in our yeah, uh, last week gospel reading in John, it says that when Philip was called by Jesus, then he called Andrew. And this is what is going on in Matthew 28, which is called the Great Commission. The Great Commission is, Jesus is asking us, he is, he is actually commanding us. That's why it's called the Great Commission, because he's saying, go and find others. Because our God, I always say, as I, as I say on the, on the radio itself also, that our God, the Christian God, is a God of love. He is, he is the embodiment of love. He calls people, he, he doesn't want anybody to perish. He wants everybody to repent so that we get eternal life through him. And that's why when we, Jesus finds us, then we automatically start finding other people. Third thing, when Jesus actually finds us, he already knows us. He told Andrew, when I knew you, you were, when you are under the fig tree, when he was talking to this woman on the well, he told her that you were living with five husbands before, and now that you are living, he's not your husband. He knows us all the time. He knows us because he is God. That's the problem with, with our Muslim friends, with our Hindu and Sikh friends. When I talk with them, I ask them, I ask them, what is your problem? So they say our problem is that we do not want to believe that Jesus is God. That is the biggest problem they have. Some of them are sitting that close to faith, but it is always their attitude that they cannot, they want to understand everything with human wisdom, which is not possible. Unless we have the help of the Holy Spirit, that's why when Jesus went, he sent the Holy Spirit as a helper, so that we could understand, so that we could understand everything. And that last thing which I want to talk about, Jesus finds you 
and opens up all realities. That's what happened with St. Paul. We know that on his way to Damascus, when he was confronted with Jesus, Jesus told him, why do you, why do you tease me? Why do you trouble me? Why do you? So he said, why, uh, who are you? And he says, if you, are, if you are troubling my people, you are troubling me. And that's, what, that's why St. Paul actually, then he comes to faith, when he comes to face to face Jesus. And ultimately, we know that he has written about one third of the New Testament. Likewise, we have so many other examples that we have. We, we should, this morning, we should understand that once Jesus is calling these people, these people actually ultimately follow Jesus. And Mark tells us that they immediately left their nets and they followed Jesus. This morning I want to ask you, if you have followed Jesus, follow heaven with everything, because they left everything and followed Jesus. I, I don't mean to say that you should not work, that you should not do other chores, but it is your heart which should be able to follow Jesus. And that's what happened to these disciples. And these disciples followed him, not only one day, two days, but all their lives. They even died for him. I don't mean to say that we should. We, we live in a, in a world and we live in a country which is peaceful. And we do not have those kind of threats. Honestly, I tell you, we have faced those threats. We have, I have personally faced those threats. And I remember in 1965 war, when I was actually seeking admission in, in university, at that time the war was going on, and I was stopped by the military. And we were questioned and questioned and questioned, and we were delayed for about two to three hours. And we didn't know what is going to happen to us. But that's, that's the cross that we have to bear. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, Canada is also becoming a very challenging country. We have these people around us who are sitting in the darkness, who, have, who are giving us challenges every day. And it is very important that we should be able to follow him with all our hearts, with all our minds. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the faith that you have given to us in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We know that when we enter the church, you see the baptism font, which reminds us of our baptism when Jesus called us to faith in him. Then we are, he's also reminded us when we come to the Holy Supper that we are going to be partaking soon, that he died for us and shed his blood on the cross so that we could be forgiven of our sins. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>
brothers and sisters in the faith, from the nations of the earth, God has called forth all people to be the sign of the unity intended for all humankind. Let us offer our prayers for the church and for its mission in the world, saying, Lord, hear our prayer. For the people of the earth, that where there is strife and division, the gift of peace may be the reward of all who work for justice. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the church of Jesus Christ, that where there is weakness, health may be restored, and where there is division, unity may be nourished. Let us pray to the Lord. For all leaders in the church, that where there is jealousy or distrust, a spirit of forgiveness and compassion may nurture humble service. Let us pray to the Lord. For all who are called to preach the gospel, that in the presence of fear and anxiety, the message of hope may be proclaimed courageously and effectively. Let us pray to the Lord. For all missionaries in foreign lands, that when faced with hardship and testing, they may be strengthened in their mission by the Spirit of God. Let us pray to the Lord. For the sick amongst us, especially Ruth, David, Deborah, Frederick, and William, that God's healing hand may rest on them and grant them quick recovery. Let us pray to the Lord. For our members, Iris V, Kate, and Graham Wingrove, who has gone to be with the Lord, that God will grant them eternal peace and their families the fortitude to bear their loss. Let us pray to the Lord. For our community and our families, that where there is misunderstanding or discord, we may receive the grace to forgive and so rejoice in the peace of Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. Let us bring our personal supplications to the Lord. God of unity and peace, in baptism you have made us one people in the body of your Son. Hear us as with one voice we offer you these prayers in the name of Jesus, who is Lord forever and ever. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy. He welcomes sinners and invites us to his table. Let us confess our sins then, confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon, and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. My sisters, my brothers in Christ, the peace of the Lord be always with you. Please extend a sign of peace to one another. Peace be with you.
Loving God, before the world began, you called us. Make holy all we offer you this day, and strengthen us in that calling. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of heaven and earth. 
By water and the Holy Spirit, you have made us a holy people. In Jesus Christ our Lord, you renew that mystery in bread and wine and nourish us to show forth your glory in all the world. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the holy people who have served you in every age, we raise our voices to proclaim the glory of your name. We give you thanks and praise, Lord our God, for the goodness and love you have made known to us in creation, in calling Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, a death he freely accepted, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, Father, according to his command, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming. We offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we, made acceptable in him, may be sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, Reconcile all things in Christ and make them new and bring us to that city of light where you dwell with all your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By whom, with whom, and in whom 
in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory are yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen, amen, amen. Amen, amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to sing. Creator of all, you gave us golden fields of wheat whose many grains we have gathered and made into this one bread. So may your church be gathered from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. The gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
let us pray. Gracious God, our hands have taken holy things. Our lives have been nourished by the body of your Son. May we who have eaten at this holy table be strengthened for service in your world. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. Amen. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Would you please be seated for some exciting announcements? While uh, uh, John and uh, Stan are making their way up to the lectern to tell you about uh, our pancake supper and our coldest night of the year team, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about a little bit more about our Lenten study, how to pray, a simple guide for ordinary people. Uh, our Lenten study begins at the end of this month. We're starting a little early because there are eight sessions, not five, <laughs> eight sessions. And uh, we start this Wednesday, or rather this, this 31st, the last day of January, with the Wednesday group. And that, of course, is on Zoom every Wednesday evening at 8 p.m. And uh, that is, of course, you can Zoom on from anywhere, from your study, from your living room, wherever, in the comfort of your home. You don't have to go out at night in the winter time. And the best part is you can invite a friend to come along with you. You know that person you went to high school with who lives in Winnipeg? Why not invite them to come to the study with you? Because you can. Go fishing. Go, oh, go fishing, that's right, go fishing. And then of course we have a lend, uh, the gathered study which will happen on Saturday mornings at 10 here at Christ Church. And the, 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 the hook on that one is you get all kinds of treats and coffee and tea and all that stuff and you get to see people in person so both are good uh, please do sign up in the narthex immediately uh, following um, today's service before you go to coffee hour and here we go so many good things i can't i can't describe them all <laughs> good morning everyone so I am happy to announce after a three-year hiatus that we are bringing back the Pancake Supper on Shrove Tuesday. So, and I've offered to lead this event this year. So, uh, <laughs> yes, getting ready for this. So, for those of you that are new to the church, before the pandemic, we used to have the pancake dinner on Shrove Tuesday every year. It was led by one of our long-term, uh, long-time parishioners, John Hall. Uh, John did a wonderful event. He ran this uh, this event every year. It went really well. So I've offered to continue on that for this year. Um, it's a great time for food, fellowship, and all the proceeds were going to the St. Louis Outreach. So like the focus today, the children's focus and the sermon, I too am a fisherman um, and I am fishing for volunteers. <laughs> I need help. I do. This is my first year doing it. There's a lot of work. John had this. It seemed to run seamlessly with, with John. I'm going to try to follow in those footsteps and I'm going to need some help. So I need probably at least 10 people to help out with this. Um, whether it's cooking, um, serving, cleaning up, I've already voluntold my family that they're helping. Thank you, Oliver. <laughs> and so I'll be downstairs at coffee hour if you'd like to volunteer or inquire further. If you want to think about it, check your schedules. My number is in the uh, leaflet. You can give me a call. We can find some, um, you know, we can at least arrange this. So the more volunteers we have by next Sunday, then we can start selling tickets next Sunday. So the date will be February 13th. 
the day before Valentine's Day. So if you don't want to wait at a restaurant or go out on Valentine's, we all know how busy it is. Pancake Supper, February 13th. So hope to see you all there. And I'll see you either downstairs or outside if you want to um, think about doing some volunteering. Thank you so much. a lineup for announcements this morning. Uh, I just have a very quick, brief announcement from the uh, Parish Selection Committee just to give you an update. The committee met last week um, via Zoom with the Bishop for our first uh, meeting as a group. And it was just an overview, um, explained how Canon 10 um, helps us to the process in determining um, how we go about getting our new rector for the parish. Uh, we do have a meeting scheduled for the end of the month and uh, we will continue to update you at that point. At this point it was just um, the bishop. There are two coaches that um, have been assigned to help us along in this process and our next meeting will be with them. So we hope to have more information for you at that point. Okay, thank you. I will keep this brief, or keep it as brief as I can. Um, Happy New Year. It is that time of year again. It is coldest night of the year. For those of you who may not know about Regeneration Outreach Community, they are one of our longtime parish partners. They're located about an eight minute walk that way. And uh, they provide daily and ongoing care to the most vulnerable in our city. Uh, this is an organization that our church has supported uh, for many years now, and every year their largest fundraiser is coldest night of the year. It's an opportunity to spend some time outside on a Saturday in February. This year it is Saturday, February 24th. It's an opportunity for you to feel a little bit cold, maybe feel a little bit uncomfortable, and that's intentional because it's to give you perspective. Uh, just to, to put you in the shoes of those who, uh, due to many unfortunate circumstances, they live in uncomfortable situations every day. So whether you would walk with us, whether you would prayerfully or financially support our team, um, I am here speaking on behalf of Jeremy Yukama. He is not able to be here this Sunday, but he is our team lead this year. He's done a phenomenal job. Uh, we've got five members on our team. Um, I am a hypocrite because I'm telling you all to join the team and I haven't joined yet. So that's gonna be the first thing I do this afternoon. You can hold me accountable to that. Um, and right now we're sitting in eighth place. So it has nothing to do with the standings. We've always had a long time fun feud with Grace Church downtown. It has to do with tangibly supporting an organization that has a tangible impact in our city. So I too am fishing, but I'm fishing on behalf of Jeremy. We're fishing for walkers, and we're fishing for donors, and we're fishing for prayers. So if you would keep that in your hearts and minds, you'll hear more about it as it goes on. I'll be at coffee hour if you have any questions. Last but not least, and this is extremely exciting, it gives me great pleasure to tell you all that Father Byron turned 30 on Friday. Uh -huh. Now, poor Ron. Ron is always roped into these songs. So, before I graciously ask him to be roped into this song, I'm going to fish for him. Do we have any other birthdays that we can celebrate with dads? Oh, okay. Another 30 year old. All right. Anyone else? Amelia Bickerstaff. Amelia, ooh. How old is Amelia turning? 11. Okay. Last call? Anyone else? Okay. Jessica. And when's Jessica's birthday? Tuesday. Okay. Where's Jessica? There she is. Okay. A happy birthday to you. A happy birthday to you. May you find Jesus here every day of the year. Happy birthday to you. A happy birthday to you. And the best you've ever had. He loves 
hugs, he loves nuggies, he loves anything that you want to give him. It's uh, solemnly, it's his last birthday with our parish, so be sure to be sure to show him your gratitude at coffee hour. Thank you, everyone. Let's stand and praise God together and hope to see you at coffee hour. My siblings in Christ, our Eucharist has ended, but our service now begins. Be fishers of people by being the voice, the hands, and the feet of Christ to each other and the whole world. Thanks be to God. <laughs> 